Hallelujah. May Jesus Christ be praised forever and ever. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you, O oh Lord. We honor you. We bless your holy name. Spirit of the living God, may you brood over your church, O oh Lord. May you brood over every soul that is getting closer to you in your word. May you open us up for revelation and knowledge, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus. 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 Thank you because you always hear us. Your name be glorified. That you have taken precedent over teaching us and making us to know you and understand you. Amen. Amen and amen. The Lord Jesus Christ be praised forever and ever. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12. It's a very short passage. I pray that as you read it, the Lord spoke to you. So many ways. So many ways. It's a short passage. Jeremiah asked a question. <clears throat> something on, the, on his mind or in his heart. And King David also spoke about the same thing. I bet, I believe he also wondered why the wicked people do the things they do, you know, they flourish in the land. And again, another man in the book of Sam, you know, the book of Sam, everything in the book of Sam is not, is, is not totally or entirely by King David. Uh, Psalm 73, I will take you there. Uh, a psalmist, he was a singer in the temple. I mean, he was a singer who sing when the church, the children of God gather to have congregation. His name was Asaph. He was from the tribe of the Levi. So he was a Levite. So from a priesthood, a priestly family. He also wondered why the wicked people who are wicked are able to flourish in the land. Why God doesn't just kill them immediately when, you know, wickedness is found in them. You know, as human as he was, he wondered about it. And I believe that you and myself, even in our present day time, we also have a question or two. And we ask God, we, uh, we wonder, maybe you've asked your pastor, you've asked the prophet, you know, you've asked a fellow believer that the next door neighbor, he doesn't go to church, he doesn't pray, he doesn't fear God. You see them do alcohol, drugs and everything. Yet they are living a normal life. Yet their ways are very prosperous. Why is that? Why is that? And um, the heading for chapter 12, the first part, it says judgment for the wicked. Judgment for the wicked. Before we start, I want to take you to Psalm 73. What Asaph, A-S-A-P-H, Asaph, that psalmist, he was a singer. Let's let's look, let's read something about what he said about the wicked people, and then we read some thirty-seven. What David, King David, also said about wicked people. Then we will see what Jeremiah is also saying about wicked people, and then we will put it all together. We will get a broad picture of what God want it to be settled in our heart concerning the wickedness of some people. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone 
my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I love this man. He, he's been honest with God, you know. When he checks his next door neighbor, he checks the people in his community. These people are flourishing. Yet they are not working tire, tirelessly, you know, in the house of God. They are not singing for God. They are not praising God. Yet they are prospering in all that they are doing. So he said he, he got envious of them. He envied them. And I bet if you go deep inside your heart. When we, when we use God's telescope or microscope to get inside, deep inside your heart, perhaps we may find a tiny envy about those people we know in our lives who are not walking in the way of God's holiness. Yet everything is going well. They have even the best jobs. They are, they are the supervisors. They are the boss. They are the CEOs. When you look at the life that we are in, you see people who are striving for holiness. They go and beg those in the world for jobs to have something little to feed their family. Yet those who own these companies, these businesses and everything, majority of them, Satan is their God. They serve the devil. They make evil sacrifices. So what's going on? What is it telling us? So many people have backslidden. Asaph confessed here. He said, I nearly... He said, but as for me, my feet were almost gone, almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish. Who, are, who is he calling the foolish? Those who don't know God and are wicked in their ways. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, when he saw the money, you know, and everything these people are enjoying, he got envious and he almost stopped worshiping God to go and follow them, to go and learn the secrets of the hidden, the hidden people. Verse 4 says, For there are no bounds in their death, but their strength is firm. So he was making comparison. You know, they are they are strong, they are energetic, you know, they are healthy, they are always full of smiles. They are always happy. They are enjoying life pretty much. He said, they are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued with, they are not, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covered them as garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and they speak wickedly <laughs> concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither and, and waters of a full cup are wrought out to them. Are wrought out to them. And they say, How do God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. You see? So this man is just, he keeps ranting about how the wicked people are prospering, you know. So they keep increasing in their riches. It, it baffles him. I, I, and I'm saying that even our time, even their wickedness has 
you know, increased more. You see people join all this ritual, demonic cult, you know, occult, occult and other things. They, they are doing things that are not right. They are doing things that are not right. Yet they keep prospering. They are having wealth. They are having riches and everything. And so Asaph is, is asking all this, this. This is this is him singing and asking God all these things. You see, a psalm of Asaph. A psalm means a song. So he's recalling, recalling all these things that wicked people do. How they are always setting trap for those who don't, you know, they are innocent. People who are naive in the society, killing them, you know, getting away with every bad thing they do in the society. Yet their ways are prospering. But when you read down, when you read down, he says, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day, for all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. So Esau is saying that, you know, living among these wicked people, he, he, he couldn't wrap his mind around why are they prospering? They are always prospering. Everything is going well for them. Why is that? So he had to get closer to God in God's temple for God to make him understand the end of the wicked. So the next verse for this 73, the heading says God's view of wickedness. Now pay attention so you understand. Verse 18 says, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casted them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream, when one awaketh, so, O oh Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reign. So foolish was I, and ignorant I was as a beast before thee. You see, so now he is now confessing that he has become foolish in his imagination and thought, thinking that this People, you know, they've gotten away with everything. They are prospering. Nothing evil is happening to them. They are rather, you know, destroying and putting good people, you know, they are destroying good people and all that. Until God opened his eye, God gave him understanding for him to know the end of the wicked. That is quite interesting to know. So if you didn't know, please make time and read the entire Psalm 73 and you will get a great understanding about people who are wicked, people, you know, who are not serving God, yet their ways are prospering. Their end is very, very bad, it's ugly. So the, at the end of the matter is that don't be envious of them. Now, David also wanted about the wickedness of people. So Psalm 37, he said, fret not thyself because of evil doers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Verse 9 says, for evil doers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. When you come to 
when you come to verse 6, the wicked plotted against the just and gnashed upon him with his teeth. So in, in, in between all this, all this uh, Psalm 37, you see the end of the wicked. 13 says, the Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. Verse 14 says, the wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. Verse 16 says, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Many wicked. So here, David was even admonishing, advising us who are diligently serving the Lord wholeheartedly in pureness of heart that the little that you have, you know, you are working with your hands, you are busy making ends meet. You are not having the millions or quazillions, but he's saying that God blesses the little that you have you will have a peace of mind in your heart and spirit more than the one who is wicked. There is no rest for the wicked, beloved. There is no resting for the wicked. And their end thereof is, like I said, is very ugly. And Jesus also said it. Jesus Christ said, he said, for what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world? But that's what loses his soul. So Jeremiah, now let's come back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was also wondering why these wicked people, both the, the ones that are that were inside Israel, part of their citizenship, why they keep living, why everything is going well for them, why the wicked people who are the enemies of Israel, everything is going well for them because if they are working for the devil, shouldn't they be uh, going through, shouldn't they have challenges whatsoever? Why is it going well for them? Now, when you come to Jeremiah chapter 12, and, and then let's examine what the question that baffles Jeremiah about the wicked people. So I read in Jesus name, Jeremiah 12. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgment. Wherefore do the way of the wicked prosper? So this is a question Jeremiah is asking God. Why are the wicked people prospering? Why? This and many other funny questions that most Christians of today, they have the same thing in mind. And at times, because they are not getting any head on with answers that really makes sense to them, the enemy is able to steal you know, their heart, deceive them, and then they will go and join the quickest route to make money. You see the young ladies and the young men fornicating here and there to make ends meet. But just as David, the Lord opened him up for understanding about the ways of the wicked and their end thereof. You see, many of the prophets of old, uh, those in uh, with those they call minor prophets, because their books, their books, the books they wrote were very short. The Hosea, Hosea, uh, Amos, Obadiah, Habakkuk, they all spoke about it. They all wondered. They say there are there are few good men in the land and the wicked men grow old and they prosper in the land but the 
the good men, the righteous men, they they never live long and their days are cut off. You know, they are taken off the land. And so the wicked prosper and they live long. On Why is this so? Many wonder. Maybe you are also wondering the same thing. But I pray that the Lord will really open you up for understanding. Because I believe at me too, at one point, at some point in my life, I'd also asked the same question. I've also wondered, why is it like that? If God hates sin, if God cannot stand sin, why are these people on the land prospering? And some with their wickedness, some people are so wicked and they are so stingy with money. They have a lot of money. They neither give people, they neither do good in the community, they waste it, they waste, they spend lavishly. Why are these people living and prospering and everything? Then, at, as I, I got closer to the Lord through the word of God, now the Holy Spirit has opened my heart up for understanding. And I pray that you too, you'll be open up for understanding that to everything, there is a season. So even if the wicked live 999 years on the earth, whatever line, limit God has put on every soul, they will not extend See, back in Africa, I, I had many stories where people will go to different, different deities, different, different lesser gods, and they will go and swallow a stone, a ritual stone, or some kind of stuff inside into their bellies. And they will be deceived that they will never die. They will live forever. But they will grow old or they will come to the point where they need to die because their end on the earth that God has given them has come. But because of the evil they have swallowed, they, can, they cannot die and they will be, they will be suffering. I've, I've heard stories and they are not just mere myth or just mere stories made up stories no these are real real things people who actually witness you see that you hear that those wicked people who swallow this uh falsehood a uh, crazy thing that they thought they were escaping death they will be there and maggots will be coming out of their body how nasty and how foolish God, they are getting rotten, but they are still alive. They cannot die. Why? Because it has it. They have exchanged their souls for something. So the end of the wicked, beloved, the end of the wicked. Even if physically you you don't see them struggling and suffering whilst they die whether they live a good, a long age or not, their end thereof is eternal punishment in hell. Their end, and God has appointed, especially our time now, God has set, has allowed and permitted everything to the day of judgment. So when you come to Revelation I believe 22, he said, those who are wicked, let them continue to be wicked. Those who are holy, let them continue to be holy. So, wickedness shall abound. Yes. They will prosper in their wickedness. Yes. But is the prosperity coming from God? No. It's not coming from God. The devil is keeping them comfortable. So they will keep sinning and end up in hell. That is the sad part of their life. That is the sad part of their life. 
the God is permitting everything to the appointed time of judgment. Those people who don't acknowledge God, they are wicked in whatever they are doing. Beloved, the Lord wants you to, because that's the understanding he gave me. These people who give offering human sacrifice, animal sacrifices to the devil, to the deities they are serving. So they will keep their ways, you know, for them. But whatever they are doing, even if they live 100 years or 150 years or 20, they, their end will still come. So you are the child of God. Get that understanding. And don't be worried about their prosperity, their temporal enjoyment, their, their time set, a fixed amount of time enjoyment. You, we have to focus on our eternal enjoyment rather than be much concerned about their temporal enjoyment. So I pray you get that part. I pray that you get that understanding. Because it is important so the enemy doesn't deceive you. So you don't look for the shortcut to life and end up in the enemy's den. The lion's den. And end up because many who get away from God to serve the devil, the enemy will make you die in a very short amount of time. Why? Because he doesn't want them to repent and go back to Christ. He has to take your life, get you in hell. So you'll be there weeping and gnashing your teeth forever. Let us be vigilant in our time. Jeremiah wanted to understand. Now God is making us to understand. He said, where do the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously. Those who deal wickedly, why are they happy? Why are things going well for them? The answer has been provided. You as a child of God, we have to focus, just as Apostle Paul was teaching the citizens in the area of Thessalonica. He said, keep your life busy. Keep your life busy. Mind your own business. Work with your hands. Don't be a busy body gossiping and worrying over unnecessary things. And do your business with integrity of heart. Don't do bribery and corruption whatsoever. We must keep doing what God has called us to do. Living at peace and forget about their wickedness. They are able to oppress the righteous people. Paul and Peter and James, you know, they were all being oppressed by the wicked people. The hypocrite Pharisees, the hypocrite Jewish people, they were all oppressed. Jesus forewarned us, he forewarned them. He said, a time is coming, they will kill you thinking they are doing God a favor. They will kill you thinking that they are doing God a favor. He said they didn't say when they are going to kill you, but I will come and rescue you. Because he said that we shouldn't be afraid of someone who will take a gun or a knife and kill this flesh. But your soul and your spirit cannot be killed by them. They cannot have your soul or spirit. That is the most important part. If there is anything we must guard and be jealous and be envious about, it is guarding our own soul and spirit and making sure that our soul walk uprightly with God. Nothing else matter. If, if this body gets weakened with whatever the sickness or disorder may be, but at the end of the day, we guard Jealously, our soul and spirit, making sure it is the Holy Spirit that is ruling us and we make it to heaven. It is far best 
it is best for us. I, I don't want to even use the word better. It is best for us. Because Matthew 5, Jesus said, it is best, it is better you enter heaven with one eye. When you are disabled in one eye, your eye is not there. Or your one hand is cut off. You have a disabled body. It's better you, your soul and spirit will enter the rest of God and be with him in heaven than rather what? Have the whole body be prosperous in whatever not, you know, enjoy everything on this earth and end up gnashing your teeth. Jesus gave an a analogy of, uh, of Lazarus and that rich man. People always say it's just a mere story, but Jesus was talking about life after death. What happens in life after death? What happens when you have been buried and everybody is saying rest in peace and they are, they are shouting and singing and they think that, oh, you are resting in the bosom of the Father. Meanwhile, you are down there gnashing your teeth in, in fire, in torment. So you and I, we have to be thinking. We have to be focused. We don't have to worry ourselves sick about any, anybody's prosperity. Focus on Jesus. Focus on knowing God. Focus on serving God. Rather than what? On any other thing. Hallelujah. So if you do not get anything from this chapter, then understand the question that Jeremiah asked, and if you had also wondered about it, I pray that this understanding the Lord is giving to us will also settle in your heart and give you a peace of mind. You will surely have a peace of mind from this moment forward. So you don't compare your life to anybody, not a sister, not a brother, even twins, even twins when they are born, Everybody and their destiny. Everybody and their destiny. And what could happen to any of those twins? The one who came first or the one who came second? We see the life of Esau and we see the life of Jacob in the Bible. We must not be worried about any of that. Praise the Lord. Then, looking at 14 to 17, it's also a prayer. Jeremiah was praying that God will have mercy because God in this chapter that I, I had not read when you look at the verse 7 to 13 thereabout, God, who is a merciful God, the verse 15 says, after he has uprooted them, I will again have compassion on them. God answered Jeremiah all right. And reassured him that Jeremiah, your children, your, your people, you know, your even your father's household, the, the, the city where you come from, their wickedness and everything. I am a mother. And as a mother, back in Africa, we say that if your child uh, have, have a bowel movement, you know, as in messed up on your on your laps. You do not cut the entire tie or your laps away and say that, oh, my baby poo poo on me, so um, I need to cut off my tie. But you wipe it off and clean that baby up. God said, if a mother can even forget their suckling baby, I, the Lord, I will not forsake. I will not forget you. So he, even in their wicked state and everything, God still remembered them that they are his beloved, which shows the deep, in-depth level of God's love and compassion. And that is why if the Holy Spirit is truly ruling your life and in you, and you claim that you are serving this God, and you have unforgiveness in you. You can't let go of things easily. You, 
you keep you are record keeper of bad things people have done to you then i don't know which god you are serving i don't know which god you are serving because the breath the width the depth of god love cannot be explained when you look, look at the his wrath and all the judgment he passed on these people then he will, he will turn around, he will come back again and say, I will still have mercy on them again. After I have scattered them, after I have permitted their enemies to come crush them, I will bring them back to me again. Which, which shows that if you are serving this God, then indeed you are on the right side. You are on the right path. Because the devil doesn't forgive. No, the devil doesn't forgive at all. So those who are on the devil's side, I pity them. So why would you even envy the envious of such a person? The devil doesn't forgive. If anybody is a Satanist, a ritualist, they will tell you that if, if they are not able to, you know, follow the principle, whatever it is, the enemy lay down for them the punishment they receive because the, the devil doesn't forgive he he will rarely give you any chance he will just utterly destroy you because that is his nature his nature is to destroy to kill to steal hallelujah but we serve the merciful father he said after all those things, I will bring them back to me. God called Israel his inheritance. Wow. What an awesome God. What a merciful God. What an amazing God we have. He loves us so dearly. And th that should also teach us compassion. That we should be people who have mercy. We should show mercy and compassion. We should show mercy and what? Compassion. And when you read down, he was telling those, those enemies of Israel that he, even the enemy, he gives them the grace to change, to repent. He said, if those enemies of my beloved, my people, if they will repent, they will forgo their evil ways, wickedness, and they will learn the good way of my people, then I will allow them or permit them to live among my people. If not, I will totally destroy them. I will not show them mercy. I will do what? I will totally destroy them. So it, it tells you the in-depth. He's the God of chances. He gives people chance, opportunity to do the right thing. So indeed, we are privileged and honored to be serving this great and mighty God. This great and amazing God. He really loves us. He really cares. He cares about souls. He cares about humanity. This is the God we have to continue and focus on serving. Hallelujah. We need to continue and focus on serving. He, God spoke about how the, the land of Israel become desolate. A, a land that was once flowing with honey and milk and everything was fruitful. He said, when, when they sow, they are not reaping anything out. Nothing is going to come out of a desolate land. Why? Because when you, anything outside of God, anything outside of God is fruitless. Especially if you are in God, if you believe in God and you call on him, then we must be 100% in him. We can't have our foot here and the next foot there. We know it has to be holy and fully in God. 
it has to be holy and fully in God in order to experience his glory, his blessing, and everything that he has said that he would do and fulfill in the life of his children. So when things are not going right and things are really going, it's like your life is going down. Check your life. Your private life. The ones that nobody can see. The sin of the mind. The sin of the heart. And repent of it all. Now as you do that and you seek the face of God with all your heart, he will turn to you embrace you just like the father of the prodigal son did he had new ropes put on him and he did a, he did through a party saying that he was once lost now he's been found this is the god that we are serving i pray i pray he uh verse 10 he also spoke about how the people who are supposed to be shepherd of his children, instead of bringing them closer to God, these people have poisoned the mind of, of, of God's children. There is a great tax and responsibility for all those who preach the good news. You can't let money influence whatsoever make you bend or twist the word of God or water down the gospel in any way. Because if you do, if you do, God's judgment, great judgment awaits. I pray that even as we've started in him in, in a good way, we will also end it. Our days on the earth will end up we knowing him, still standing in his ordinances and obeying him and living holy for him. Because those who will stand to the very end, Jesus said, they shall be saved. They shall receive that reward. Not those who go back. Not those who twist the, the Bible in the, in the, along the line as they as they are serving the Lord, they get influence, they take bribe and they begin to corrupt the vineyard of God, which are the church, the children, the souls, the saints of God. He has his winnowing as or sword. He's going to furrow or burrow through, even cutting down from the root any tree which is not bearing good fruit not just a fruit, good fruit for that matter. May God help us. May God grant us understanding that we will not fret, we will not be worried, we will not be jealous. Even if the natural human instinct of jealousy will come, we will kick it out. If you've not given your life to Jesus, today is the day. God is ever ready to receive you with open arms. All you have to do is to believe Jesus Christ. Accept him as your Lord and personal Savior. Confess him with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That he died for your sins. That he resurrected so you'll be saved. And you accept him. And as you accept him, your name will be written in the, in the Lamb Book of Life. You will join the saints of God to worship and to learn and to mature in him and his holy spirit as you open yourself up his holy spirit will fill you up if you're already in christ and for one reason or the other you've backslidden today is the day to rededicate your life to jesus whatever whatever drew you back if you are willing to let go and follow God wholeheartedly now. The Holy Spirit is ever ready to help you. Just genuinely confess whatever you did. Ask him to revive you and restore you. And I know 
a God who is merciful, ever merciful and compassionate, who have mercy on you. May God bless you. May God keep you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.